Thank you to Beth, our program admin, co program coordinator, and Chioma, our multimedia and marketing assistant for their work behind the scenes. Our goal for this series is to connect staff from across the university with faculty affiliates of the center who study, teach, and write about race and, race and ethnicity. We wanted to create an informal and interactive space where staff can learn firsthand about some of the exciting research that's happening on campus and provide the op an opportunity for faculty and staff to network with hopes that we will find some shared interests and possibilities for future collaborations. You can subscribe to our Research Bites and CSRPC listservs to be notified about future conversations. They'll be dropped in the chat a little later. The first 25 staff members to register for Research Bites events will always receive a $25 Grubhub credit to buy lunch on us. Congratulations to those who are enjoying their lunches on us right now. <laughs> um, but uh, we, and just just so there's no confusion, um, the perks are always reserved for staff only, but we welcome students as well to join us in the room today. Today we are joined by a very, very special guest, Gina E. Miranda Samuels. And I'm gonna give her bio here. Gina E. Miranda Samuels is a faculty director at CSRPC and professor at the Crown Family School of Social Work Policy and Practice. Using critical standpoints, epistemologies and interpretive methods, she explores processes of displacement, belonging and healing among persons whose early childhoods include transracial adoption, foster care and home loss. Centering emic knowledge, her work identifies dimensions of social policy and practice that are rooted in biocentric and monocentric notions of fam race, family, home, and home, rendering them ill-fitting and often harmful to the well-being and health, healthy development of many young people and families. Her work has introduced the field to concepts including survivalist self-reliance and ambiguous loss of home among youth and foster care. Racialized, racialized epistemic trauma and adoption and the centrality of racial, relational, sorry, over legal permanence in family identity and critical place making as a radical and socially just proxies with young people navigating homelessness. She is also co-author of the book, Multiracial Cultural Attunement, featuring a model for anti-racist practice with individuals and families. Professor Miranda Samuels, Gina E. Miranda Samuel, sorry, research has been presented as testimony to the United States Congress and used to inform the agendas of state and federal government agencies, including the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, the Children's Bureau, and the Administration on Children, Youth, and Families. In 2016, she was named one of 14 most impactful social work scholars in the United States. Professor Samuels is a 21 year member of the University of Chicago community and affiliate of CSRPC and a member of More Than Diversity, a faculty led activist campaign to more fully realize democratic, socially just practices and experiences of freedom and liberation within the University of Chicago and beyond. Please give a warm welcome to our friend and faculty member, Gina E. Miranda Samuels. Thank you. <laughs> so, thank you, Tara. That was a long intro. That was <laughs> thank you, though, for, for that introduction. And I'm going to switch over to my uh, slides here. So thank you, everybody, for showing up on a cold day on Zoom. This is my perfect time to use Zoom. It's throughout the winter months when we don't necessarily have to leave. So I hope everyone's somewhere snuggly. Um, if we were in person, since we're not, I'm going to say this, it's a little harder to do online, but I really do a lot better if I get going and then you all interrupt me. And it's harder to do that on Zoom, so I'm going to try to remember to stop periodically and just ask some questions. But I really, I told this to Tiara and Chioma, and I'm going to tell it to the rest of you, I am absolutely okay with being interrupted, and I feel like we go better places when that when that happens. So I've got something planned, and I can do the moi, 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 but but um, it'll be more fun for all of us if I if I don't do that. So what I'm wanting to talk t today on is mostly um, focusing on a recent autoethnography that I wrote about my own experience in transracial adoption. Um, but I'll jump around a little bit and give some history um, for those of you for whom this might be a, a newer topic. 
Um, so we'll start a little bit with talking about politics and history of transracial adoption. That's TRA. So I'm going to be using that for short. Then we'll t I want to sort of highlight this idea of information, poverty, and ambiguous loss that it oftentimes characterizes the developmental context in which many of us grow up and navigate our um, identity work. And then if we have time and we don't get off on, on better tangents, we'll talk a little bit about sort of where do we go based on this uh, information. So. But first, I think it's important for you to know where I'm coming from with this. So this is yours truly um, and my sister on the picture on, I guess, your left of your screen. My sister and I are, um, I'm sure I'm singing something. So I um, have this uh, love of music. I have a, a degree in music. And so here I was launching this and I think my sister was like, I don't know, backup girl or something. But you can see also we've got um, these jeans on. My sister's wearing the signature Oshkosh Bagash bib overalls. And that's where we grew up. So we left Chicago um, when after I was adopted out of foster care as an infant. And we moved up to this weird land called Oshkosh, Wisconsin. And that's where I grew up and much of my understanding about race and our family is being different. Um, as you can see in the lower corner, all of us look different. So there was no uh, resemblance of anyone. So everywhere we went, we were sort of um, an odd spectacle up there. I am, I think, the first um, black graduate of my kindergarten, my uh, elementary, my high school, my middle school, et cetera, so on, so on. So um, many of the stories that I uh, have, including now, are of that kind of a, a racial experience. And I also feel like I should say, because a lot of times people assume, because I take such a critical stance on adoption, that somehow I had a horrible experience. Actually, I actually didn't have a horrible experience. My horrible experience was more around racism, and I might uh, talk about that should anybody be interested. But I, I actually, um, my, my research and my interest in this doesn't come from a place of feeling like, um, I had a, a horrible experience, but I'm very attuned to what the issues are because this is my own lived experience. So it is from that place of being an insider that I that I speak. So I think it's first and really important to to just know and make sure all of us have this sort of anchor of history of where um, the the ways in which in the U.S. and in many Western nations that have the same exact exact history that we do with colonization, white supremacy. Um, Canada. Some of you might be familiar with the uh, um, boarding schools where they have um, exhumed bodies of children, native children there um, that were um, never acknowledged and hidden. Um, so Canada has this history. We have this history. Australia has this history. So there's many different nations that have this history of using child removal as an actual form of cultural genocide and um, assimilation. And so um, here we have in 1980, so this is what you're looking at is a picture of one of these boarding schools in the US. Uh, General Pratt, Con Con Colonel Pratt rather, was understood to be the founder of the Indian boarding schools. And um, he is quoted as saying um, that a uh, great general has said that the only good Indian is a dead one. And in a sense, I agree with the sentiment, but only in this, that all the Indian there is in the race should be dead, kill the Indian in him and save the man. And this was really the philosophy and ethos with which this first sort of iteration of removal of children to solve the quote unquote race problem in the US where child removal was used and, and very explicit um, cultural assimilation um, was part of, that, part of that process. And so here what you're looking at is before and after pictures of some folks whose histories were um, included Indian boarding school um, experiences. And children were um, severely beaten, some died, they were forced to work, and so it was not a, it was a, a horribly traumatic and abusive and violent um, period of our history. And again, this was happening all over the world um, with indigenous populations. Um, over time, uh, the 1990s became characterized as a history of the use of um, family-based based placements of child removal um, with transracial adoption. And so we have kind of the end of the boarding school movement that then morphs into the 1990, 1945 and thereon Indian Adoption Project, where children were forcibly removed um, in partnership with social workers. 
to um, white families, much for the same purpose, but it was now not a mass boarding school congregate care setting, but families um, were involved in this process. You have also in the 1940s, some of the very first, uh, what we would call now transracial placements, but at those in those days, they weren't necessarily considered transracial placements. They were um, mixed race children um, that based on their skin tone would be placed and racially matched in terms of where they were thought to possibly fit best. And so there was even a, a medical center up in Minnesota where babies would be sent um, to have their future racial appearance be tested and predicted. And then based on that, they would be placed um, accordingly racially. Um, my own experience, I was in foster care waiting to turn color so that I could be racially placed and that was in the late 60s. So this is a pra practice that continued um, quite far into the 1990s. Also, the first wave of transracial placements include mi mixed kids from outside of the U.S. that were a result of wars where U.S. and European soldiers had been and produced children with um, whatever country um, the women were from, and the mixed race children there were receiving um, pretty extensive racism and hostility um, because of their mixed race status. And so those children were adopted out to Western nations where um, white families were adopting them. By the 1960s, we had a, a public adoption situation where one in every three children who were indigenous or black were placed in white homes. And so you started seeing some activism happen in the 70s around concerns of communities of color about what was happening. What, how, why were we continuing to use outplacement of children from their own cultural, racial, and ethnic communities? So you have in 70, 1972, the National Association of Black Social Workers, that's NABSW at the bottom of that square, and they put out a statement calling for the end of transracial adoptions <clears throat> and also using the language of cultural genocide. You also have in 1978 um, specific legislation around um, Indian children, Native children, Indigenous children being continuing to be placed out of home. Um, but two interesting things happen there. In the case of the Indian uh, Child Welfare Act, which is what I ICWA stands for, ICWA, you have because tribes have sovereign status, you have legislation that ultimately leads to the Indian Child Welfare Act, which grants uh, tribes first right to determine what is the best interest for Native children. Later in the 1990s, you have a legislative movement where uh, whites and a few um, black Congress uh, women were involved in using civil rights law to say that race and culture and ethnicity should not be used to determine the best interests of children. And so um, both of those pieces of legislation were successfully passed. And so now in the US, we have these really interesting dual tensions in our policies around, on the one hand, for Native children saying race, ethnicity, culture, we have this horrible history. It is absolutely important as a remediation to that history in, of adoption and outplacement that people within that community have a right to determine the best interest and placement of their children. And then for everyone else, we have this other equally powerful um, legislation that says, no, you absolutely cannot use race and culture to determine the best interests of children. And if you do that and an adoptive parent feels that you have used race or ethnicity to determine the best interest of that child in a way that delays that placement, they can sue up to a million dollars that agency. And court cases have actually occurred where social workers have asked um, adoptive parents, white adoptive parents to um, develop a cultural plan for their child and those white parents uh, or prospective parents sued the agency successfully for a million dollars for being asked to develop a cultural plan. So we continue to have a lot of tension in our uh, systems, particularly for those of us in uh, these systems that place children about what, how should we value race? How should we value culture? Who has the rights to determine that? Who has the rights to adopt whom? Today's face of transracial adoption looks very, very diverse. So um, I guess a couple things I'll say about this slide um, is that 
although I think the politics of transracial adoption continues to sort of evoke this imagery of white people adopting black kids, um, that that is not the majority of transracial adoptions today. The majority of people um, who are transracially adopted are actually Asian um, and come from a result of China's uh, one child policy. Um, Korean War. So we have these different generations of transracially adopted people who uh, very much map onto global history and relationships of the US to various nations because of war, because of other policies, etc. So we have a huge population of transracially adopted people who are of Asian descent, who are international transracial adoptees, and all of those are um, private adoptions that happen through private agencies is very different than, for example, domestic adoptions, which was my situation that happened uh, usually one of three ways, either one through foster care, which was my situation where children are um, either voluntarily or forcibly removed and enter foster care and then become adoptable, or through private agencies where children uh, become available voluntarily through birth parents and are um, outside of the public um, policy and public um, systems of foster care, and then independent adoption, where most adoptions happen, which is very, very private and very, very unregulated, where you have an attorney that has a relationship with a biological mother, usually, um, and they together make selections about where that child will be placed, and that's fully un unregulated. Um, Gay, lesbian, transgender parents are increasingly um, becoming adoptive parents, single parents, and you also have families where kids uh, represent multiple races and ethnicities, either because parents have children biologically and by adoption, or parents do that plus adopt children from all over the world. So we're talking about a population, when we say transracial adoption, that is incredible incredibly diverse, even though I think the politics of transracial adoption always sort of regress back to white people and black or biracial children. And we can um, talk a little bit um, more about that. So I guess what I want to impress on this kind of quick race through history is that being a family formed through transracial adoption is not neutral and it's not a private situation. It's a very public experience that it's grounded and racialized and racist and classist and gendered global histories that are wildly public and very political. And so I want us just to kind of, as we were talking about this, remember that these aren't just, that it, that it is also very personal, but it's personal and very public and very political. Um, so I thought, even though I could, if it was a smaller group, I usually would be like, what are the stereotypes of being transracially adopted and mixed? But I'm just going to lay them out so that in interest of time um, and if we talk about them, I'm happy to add to it. But I always love using clip art because I think sometimes clip art represents stereotypes that are just sort of embedded in what your choices are. So as you might imagine, I was absolutely thrilled to find this person split by a rainbow. And there, um, I of course took the artistic license to make the head and the feet a little bit more extreme, different colors. But in its original form, it was kind of a beige person. And so I, I love this imagery of like this, kind of what is what is the imagery of multiracial people and many of the stereotypes for multiracial people and mixed race people and transracial adoptions are very intertwined they're kind of the same so you might imagine in my case where i am both black mixed race and from a transracially adopted families a lot of these things are sort of like mutually reinforcing uh stereotypes so we'll go through them quickly. First is that we are more attractive and exotic. So despite the fact that I might argue that, you know, there, there are some pretty ugly multiracial babies that I've seen in my day and some absolutely beautiful multiracial babies that I've seen in my day, that we have this idea that somehow being mixed that you're like exotic or, you know, attractive or beautiful. Or so people will say things like, oh my God, look at that beautiful beautiful mixed race baby, look at the eyes. And they'll always kind of pick these things that are seem to be racially um, discordant as, as somehow uh, attractive or beautiful. That somehow by embodying these sort of polar opposite racialized locations that we are the face of the future, we are rainbow children, rainbow families. And so, like I said, I, I love the fact that I found clip art with this person split in a rainbow. That somehow, you know, be embodying 
uh, racial discordance means that we're going to rescue the world from its racial woes just by our physical existence, or that mixed race families are the proof of the end of racism, which is so not true, but it sort of continues to be a, a trope that's attached to multiraciality. That we have the best of both worlds, which is um, always interesting to me, like what exactly is that and what would be the worst and what would we like genetically think um, gets washed out. And my personal favorite that by nature we are confused conflicted and mixed up that there's just something normal to be expected that the mixed race person is kind of schizoid and that comes from um, a lot of our racist science about race as biology and that we believed a long time ago that um, particularly with regard to black and white that the blood in white people ran one way and the blood in black people ran another way. So when you mixed the black and the white together, it went like this. And so um, ergo the term for multiracial people, mulatto being a mixed race infertile breed, right? So a lot of our sort of ways in which we understand multiraciality, the psychology of the multiracial experience is very much embedded in how we also socially construct race in the first place and what happens when these groups are mixing in ways that um, are not supposed to be. So I said earlier, it's, this is very public. So it's not that you just walk around in your private family doing whatever you're wanting to do, but that you get bombarded daily by these kinds of questions all the time, everywhere you go, you are accountable to other people's questions about what are you? No, what are you really? Where are you from? Where are you really from? Is that your mother? Are you together? Are you black? Are you mixed? Which are you most? And this happens all the time. And so it's not so much, I think, when you hear that mixed race people talk about like having identity struggles that we're born this way, but rather we live in this world where constantly this noise, we're being told what we are, or that we're not enough of this, or why don't you like this, or do you know how to, I dated someone who asked me, did I know what a gam was, and did I know how to make sweet potato pie, like how random a question to ask somebody on a date. So you get this all the time, and you learn to expect and anticipate having to be accountable racially to other people's understandings of you and your experience. Who are your people? There's not a side of town that's mixed race. There's not a country where that you can go to and do that. There's not a special language. So at all times, there's it's this active negotiation of you, your identity, your space, presumptions about what your experience has been like, et cetera. And you are constantly making decisions about how to engage. So I'm going to pause here because I want to uh, move into this next space about what is this like to do identity development and identity work in the context of these bombardments about your race and your body being so important to be accountable to, but also as an adopted person, oftentimes lacking basic information that allows you to navigate that from a place of confidence. So I want to stop and see if there are any questions or comments or anything like that from the, from the crew that's listening. No, Gemma, we're good. I keep going. All right, I'm gonna keep going. So, I wanted to spend a little bit of time over the over the course of my own life, and also over the course of my own teaching and training and um, writing. I've really come to find the theory of ambiguous loss and paired with this idea of information poverty to be a really helpful way of talking with people, both who are adopted, but also with people who are parenting, those of us who are adopted, about what it's like to move through the world with gaps in, in knowledge that people oftentimes take for granted that they have. And all the places where you come into contact with people assuming that you have this information. And so some of you who aren't adopted might say, well, what's the big deal? I don't know my grandpa so-and-so, or I never met, but imagine you don't know anybody. And imagine there are actually laws that prevent you from knowing these things. So that there are actually laws that that mean that as an adopted person, I can't get access to my actual birth certificate. I don't know what my, uh, if I had a name before. I don't have, because of the laws that sever um, parental rights, I don't have any authority to any of my 
own information prior to the date of my birth, which when I did a search, I learned is probably wrong. So my actual birth date that I've celebrated my whole life um, might might be not the real date. And so to have that kind of tenuous relationship to basic uh, information, the story of your birth. For those of you who are not adopted, how many times might you have heard your biological mother tell the story about how much you owe her because she was in labor for how many hours and et cetera, that these are all like tiny little things that any one of them, if you didn't know, would not probably be devastated. It's devastating, but all together make you feel like you're dropped from the sky and that you just came from nowhere. And how do you develop a sense of confidence about your place in the world when you really do have a loss of self-knowledge or your relationship to knowledge is not under your own authority and that you get to choose what's not important and what you don't want to know, etc. So this idea of information poverty is really, um, it comes out of library science. And it's a situation where it can be used broadly. So it's I'm using it here in adoption, but it hasn't been used uh, usually in adoption, but it's meant to, to convey a situation where individuals and communities in a given context don't have or are outright denied the requisite means and abilities to attain efficient access to essential information, to interpret it and apply it to their well-being, safety and health. It can be characterized by an information infrastructure like I just described in adoption that's poorly developed, fully absent, or intentionally prohibits one's access. And so we could think about a lot of places in the world where people um, experience information poverty. But I think a lot of times we don't use that to think about um, from the adopted person's perspective, how we have constructed an entire system of adoption produces information poverty for children. So part of what I'm wanting to invite us to think about is that this is actually a social justice issue. What does it mean um, to actually have a right to knowledge that's relevant to you, that you can use freely for your own benefit, for your health, for your healing, that's not regulated by someone else, right? And that's freely accessible. So what does it mean when info for your own knowing is missing? It oftentimes centers the knowledge and best interests of those with most power. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how that has happened in um, adoption, especially transracial adoption, but I would argue this is much more broad than just um, transracial adoption. So I would imagine all of you, if I asked you to raise your hands, uh, how many of you know somebody who is adopted, either you have adopted, maybe you are adopted, that you've heard people talk about it in terms of rescue. I know in my own um, life how this would go is people would say, oh, you're adopted, how lucky you are, like you seem so great, your mom is so great, that's so lucky. And in my head I'm thinking, but you don't know shit about my biological family, so how do you know I'm lucky? Like what kind of assumptions are you making about my life before? And maybe I am. And and maybe I'm not, but it's such an incredible, pa incredibly powerful uh, narrative to presume that there is this unidirectional um, way in which the transfer of resources happens where it goes from the, the poor to the wealthy or the poor to the resourced and that somehow my adoption automatically signals that I have been rescued out of poverty. In my case, I have been rescued out of blackness. Um, and I, I realize that people don't intend to say that they intend for this to be um, an acknowledgement of my achievements and a compliment, etc. But underneath that compliment is a sting about who I am racially, where I come from racially, and a group of people that are not known and oftentimes not even to myself, right? So these are oftentimes classist, racist, colonialist, uh, tropes that people use uh, that are dominant and supplant. If we don't know our own stories, then we're vulnerable to other people um, spewing out kind of the dominant think about adoption. It also can cause dismissing, marginalizing, silencing, or tokenizing. So what happens when somebody says, Gina, you're so grateful, and I say, ah, well, then I get dismissed as the angry 
black adoptee or the angry, you know, black person or black woman, right? And so it's easy then to dismiss my N of one experience against the dominant narrative. It's not powerful enough to stand on its own if we don't have our own sort of knowledge out there about what our diversity of experiences have been. It's part of why at the very beginning of this talk, I was clear about my own experience being positive so as to not be undermined later by the critical things that I'm saying to you now. Infantilizing adults, a lot of adoptive uh, writers talk about the ways in which we are perpetually seen as the children. Um, and when we are on panels or we are talked to about our own experience, to be gaslit about, well, but you don't really understand, or well, it's not the same, or there's things that you just don't know, etc. That there are ways in which birth families and nations of origin, particularly when adopted people come from poverty or nations that are considered developing or from the um, subaltern or the global south, that somehow that is um, our current condition in the West is an improvement being here as opposed to China or here as opposed to uh, India, etc that it cuts us off or dismisses the importance of our loss that is tied to minoritized racial and ethnic and cultural heritages, that that's not a sad loss and that whatever gain we've experienced um, financially in our adoptive families far outweighs racial or cultural loss that we might have to endure because of being there. And a very powerful ethos, I would argue, around minority, uh, around uh, race evasive white supremacy. So one of the most dominant narratives even today among tr particularly white, but I would argue among um, upper middle class adopters is this idea of sort of white supremacy, rainbow families, color blindness, where we're just all people and love will conquer all. And as much as the my social worker heart loves the undergird and underbelly of that, I truly do. Um, when somebody has to told me this, what I think in my mind is, wow, if you, A, you're lying to me, because I know you can see me, and B, that what you're basically telling me is that you're racist. And if we would actually, if I would demand that you see me as a person of color, you couldn't get around treating me different. And so the only way that you can't do that is for you to psychologically pretend that we're the same, which we're, we're not. So now you don't see all of my whole life um, that has existed, that has marked such a huge piece of life for many transracial, transracial adoptees, it, it positions them as alone racially in their own families and cuts them off from places of support from their parents. I really appreciate this quote from um, Reverend Keith Griffin, who has done a lot of activism in the adoption community around skin tone and colorism and the ways in which different kids of color um, experience uh, placement rates in child welfare because of um, racism. And he says adoption loss is the only trauma in the world where the victims are expected by the whole of society to be grateful. And that happens a lot. It's sort of like, where do you go to talk about the other parts of adoption? And many adopted persons feel they can't really go to their adoptive parents, particularly when they do have positive experiences, because they don't want their adoptive parents to feel they don't love them, or they aren't appreciative for a parenting that happened, or that somehow they're going to exchange them for biological family. Um, and it's hard to go and talk to your friends about it. If they're not adopted, it's hard to understand what it would mean to have two families at the same time, two moms, two dads, two whatever, two sets, four sets, however many exponentially it happens. We just don't have a world that holds complexity, I would argue in the way that many people, non-adopted and adopted actually do live. But how do, we, how do we make space for those of us whose lives really are this way to talk about and grieve the losses alongside actual gains that we do want to claim and that we, happinesses that we have had that are attached to adoptive family experiences. And so how do we not undermine and disenfranchise the grief of adopted persons or persons who have complex experiences of family, um, either intentionally or unintentionally? So this is just a slide that just gets us to think about all the different domains that are affected when somebody is experiencing 
loss in some kind of way around identity. It can affect, or I'm sorry, around information. It can affect our sense of who we are and our confidence that we are this if we don't have a group of people, especially in our own family, that reinforce daily our position. Think about in your own families, if you're not adopted, um, the ways in which we reinforce uh, resemblance and identity of like, oh, you have, you know, you have so-and-so's talent here, or you have so-and-so's eyes, or you, you know, you talk like so-and-so, or you walk like so-and-so, or you have your auntie so-and-so's laugh. These are daily things that families do every day that's resemblance talk that helps us all to feel a sense of belonging and identity in our kin group. If you're adopted, you're looking around like, hmm. You know, there are things certainly that we pick up. I do things quite a bit like people who I grew up around, but I don't get that because of my genetics. And so there's always this little fissure that's between our connections that we have in identity and belonging in our family. It can cause us to not trust. We have all experienced as adopted people the fracture of relationships that our society says are unbreakable, that blood is thicker than water. Well, not if you're an adoptee. So it's very hard to move through the world in that way when you know you've experienced a break in a relationship that was supposed to be unbreakable. A sense of connection relationally can be harmed. Meaning making and trust that you have the capacity to make meaning on your own when the rest of the world is telling you about your own experience. And the sense of agency, power, and control. So ambiguous loss really gets to that family of stuff for adopted people. It's not that your biological family went anywhere. They're just not with you. And it's not that you didn't have a name and a family someplace else or you weren't birthed like everybody else. You just don't have that information. So it's this weird ambiguity of something being partially present and partially not present. That is sort of the existential conundrum of development for many transracial adoptees that I'm wanting us to, to get at here. So I'm going to go over this quickly, but I highly encourage um, any of you who are interested in learning more about this idea of ambiguous loss to read Pauline Boss's work. She's written quite a bit about it. She has a web page about it. And it's just, I think it's a it's a, a word and a concept that touches many people. So it's not special to adoption at all. I use it as a way to sort of articulate these kind of nebulous, ambiguous losses. But I think all of us in the human world experience ambiguities in our losses and can connect to this. So type one is the kind of loss that's where it's something is physically absent, but psychologically present. So think here about immigration. When somebody has immigrated to a new nation, it's not like that nation disappears. And there are relationships and identities and experiences and lives that are happening that could have happened, but you're not there. You're physically absent, but it's continuing to go. And so how do you grieve something that is partial like that, that still exists, but you're not there? Um, adoption, you know, you have a birth family, you have a, a relatives, but you may not know them. Somebody gave birth, but they are not parenting. Are you not a mother still? Or it's not still a biological father, et cetera. In divorce, this happens, right? Where families fracture and all of a sudden become something different than they were before. And children have to grieve that and parents grieve that. The other type is type two, where something's physically present, but psychologically absent. Think here, any of you who have had a family member with Alzheimer's, they're sitting right there, but they are not the same person. How do you grieve that loss? There aren't cards that we have. I know when my mom was going through Alzheimer's, there wasn't, it's confusing. <laughs> How do you grieve somebody that is not yet dead, but they have left you in some kind of way, um, psychologically or in their person? Coma, chronic mental illness, addiction, and adoption in terms of culture, race, ethnicity. All right, so we could think of lots of examples. Another way of thinking about a type one loss is leaving without saying goodbye. Type two, we can think of as saying goodbye without leaving. And so again, I think we can think of any of us in the human condition, if you haven't yet, it's coming, where we've experienced these kinds of losses. And the thing that I want to sort of just impress is what happens when you experience this loss, um, 
is that people can oftentimes freeze this grief. It's so painful, particularly in a, in a culture like the Western culture, where we value control over everything and finality and clarity that a lot of times, um, and I'll just use the example in adoption world, a lot of times in the adoption um, world, people freeze this grief because it can't be resolved, particularly if you are in a closed adoption. And so, you know, some of the ways in which this accidentally comes into or uninformedly comes into working with families or in research is that you'll have a kid who will say, I don't even think about my adoption. Everything's fine. I'm just here and my family and there's no problems. And that would have been me. <laughs> you would have talked to me at five or six or seven or even long into my teen years. And I would have said, there's no missing hole. I don't have any problems. I am totally happy. I, uh, don't miss having a father. I grew up with a, without a dad and I'm totally fine. And I w went about my life proving to, to people exactly how okay I was. And a huge portion of me was that. A huge portion of me was that. But I was not in a place where I could grieve. And I was also understanding that there was information I would never get. And at some point you have to move forward with your life. So I think sometimes we misunderstand um, the absence of angst or the presence of academic success or other kinds of success as the absence of a grief process, as opposed to understanding that adoption always engenders a loss. It always engenders a trauma and a separation from a child, from a biological parent. And how that presents can be a bazillion different ways. Um, and just as it's not healthy to force people to grieve things that they can't fully grieve in a safe space, it's also wrong to presume that it's not a loss just because someone's not talking about it, right? And the degree to which then these other clouds are present for people, that there's no affirmation of their loss, there's no recognition of it as a loss, um, there's no way in the family to process and talk about this or that maybe the adoptive parents are still struggling with um, not being biological parents or their own infertility or the, they need their narrative to be the dominant narrative in the family and there's not room for multiple feelings about the adoption, then that can be problematic and cause adoptive people to, to kind of freeze. So I want to stop there. I can talk about kind of pathways and what we do, but I, I'm wanting to kind of open it up to the to the group. And so I see that um, Tierra, well, how, how much time Tierra Choma do we have left together? I'd like to stop talking. <laughs> Got about 13 minutes. Okay, yeah, let me, let me stop talking. I'm gonna kill the slides and um, we can kind of come together and just kind of chat. And I'm happy to talk about healing and all that kind of stuff i realized i got through the doom and gloom and didn't get to the to the kind of what is what is needed but i'd rather bring people in just to kind of talk for a minute so questions things that i said um that you want to hear a little bit more about i know it's hard to be the first person in a big smorgasbord of I'll ask a question. So I noticed you, hi Gina. I, hi. I noticed you use the word adopters uh, to refer to adoptive parents, and within the United States, it's a considered a offensive term by many adoptive parents, not necessarily by adoptees. So why do you choose to use that word? Oh yeah, don't make over meaning of that. Um, so I'm not trying to be political or anything like that. I do, I do mean when I say, I think when I say adoptee adopters, it's a, it's a shorthand way. Um, just like adoptee is offensive and adoptive adopt by people who are adopted. Um, but I don't think you should make meaning that I'm trying to make a political statement by saying adopters. There are now, but those of you who are listening, so we'll get outside of our inside crew here. There are a lot of, um, I would argue in general, there is not a good lexicon, meaning not a good set of words to talk about the different ways in which and pathways and relationships in which people come to adoption. Um, and so sometimes we now are using, instead of the term adopters, we're using terms like 
uh, second parents or adoptive parents or for biological parents, we're not using natural parents anymore. We talk about them in terms of first parents or parents of origin or families of origin. And I would say that um, I find all of the language deeply dissatisfying and just have never had the time to sit with myself and think about like, are there better words and languages to to come up with. But I do mean to say a little bit about, I, I am wanting to sort of flag, sometimes when I do use the word adopter, I am wanting to flag a power differential that is inherent um, in the transaction of, of becoming adopted and who has choice and who has power and who has policy that protects that power. Um, and who doesn't. So there is a little bit, like if you pick up a little bit of politic in my word, I do intentionally mean that, but I don't mean to use the word adopter to disregard the politics of language that is happening in our, our field. And how do we come up with a language that um, both locates people appropriately in the web of positionality and power, but also gives people agency to choose their own words that they feel best represent in their, you know, like I think parents who are adopting have a right to language and use language that affirms their experience. I also think that those of us who are adopted have that right also, and sometimes those things are going to clash. And my use of adopter here was not intended to be a clash, but it is intended to signify a particular action and agency that is inherent in the adults involved. Does that make sense? Or do you want to add something from your perspective? That makes sense. I actually agree with you that I think that the language uh, that we have available or that we use right now in the field is very limited. Um, I also think that people's experience within an adoptive family, whether they be adoptive parents, adopted persons, or birth family ranges tremendously. Yeah. For example, if you are an adoptive parent who has a very um, healthy, happy adoptive family situation, you have a much different uh, reference point than those adoptive parents who have kids who are trying to kill them. Um, and so how they want to refer to their child differs based on that. Likewise with adoptive persons, if they have warm, fuzzy adoptive parents that they completely love, then they refer to them one way, which is usually adoptive parents in the lexicon, where if they have adoptive parents who um, were doing evil things to them, adopters comes out a lot. Mm -hmm. And that's why I asked the question originally. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't meaning to signal thing too. Signal that. So thanks for bringing that up, Michelle. I appreciate that. Other questions or reactions yeah. before you, uh, is there any? Hmm. There's a question in the chat, Gina. Yeah, from, uh, is it the what are your thoughts on the types of supports or support models for children in elementary settings and or uh, high school, I'm assuming HS settings, especially in the setting in multiple placements? Yeah, it really varies. I think, you know, some schools and particularly private schools, you may have, and particularly in some communities here in Chicago, um, clusters of kids that happen to be in a cohort in a grade where something happens, you know, because parents initiated or a teacher might see an opportunity. And so you, there are these things that happen. Um, my general sense is that varies widely based on school, even within a city as diverse as Chicago. And then you can imagine varies even more so as you get outside of a city, um, nothing. And I think then you add the complexity of what that's like for a kid who's living temporarily in a foster placement versus kids that are in a adoptive home, you know? And so I just think there's a lot of general education that needs to be done across school systems, just in terms of the diversity of ways in which we all live in families that would help everyone. <laughs> you know, like I just think we live in a, such a much more complex way that um, just 
undoing this homogamous, kind of racially homogamous, everybody looks the same in a family, everybody's biologically related to their children, everybody has children, there are, there's one father, one mother, they are married, they produce children by a lot, I mean, just like, there's so many people who are trapped by that image of family, that if we busted that up a bit, it would advantage all of us, and then thinking just through how would we talk about relationships and families and ways of being related and get outside of biological that you know so there's something magic that happens when we're biologically related to, pe to people and children i think we would be really advantaged for that so i would say there's a dearth of um supports there aren't a lot there is not a lot of money that for post-adoption supports not in foster care and not in the out in the wild in the world where people adopt privately um i think because in our nation we have a general stereotype that adoption is happy always and so there's no problems so why would we have why would we need you know like why would we need to create services for a happy situation you know we're trying to get kids out of foster care and back with their biological families or you know like that's the fire that the house is on fire so i just think we're also pushing against and we wouldn't want to make it seem like everybody who's adopted it's a tragedy because that's not what the research says most adoptions play out very successfully most people who are adopted have very positive experiences so that's not the you know so it, there's this tension of like how do we support families but also not pathologize adoptive families as being any more problematic than those who are created some other kind of way whatever that other kind of way so i appreciate that that question we probably have chance for one more I have my hand up. Yes, Tracy. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't see you. Um, I have a question about um, one. Do you know the what the numbers are currently about um, black or biracial children that are adopted by black families or biracial families? Is there such mm -hmm. a statistic out there? Mm -hmm. I know you gave an earlier one from when it was one in three of yeah. black and children. And the second part of that is what 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 do you think accounts for the predominant imagery when it comes to black children who are adopted? Like the most prominent stories in the, in our cultural milieu yeah. are those of ones who are adopted by white um, families. Yeah. So I'm going to answer your question, but with a caveat that because there are so many adoptions that happen outside of public systems, our our ability to have statistics are horrible. So you know, like most adoptions that happen are not through foster care. So there's no, it's not regulated. We don't know how many there are. So the only way we would know is now the census has started to ask for the under 18 population. Is there a child in your home that's been adopted? And you can kind of do tricky math to sort of figure out what that is. And based on that, we know that there's about any as high as 40% of adoptions are transracial. So you would kind of do the reverse math and say that probably the majority of kids that are be, being adopted through any way that we can track, the majority of them are not transracially adopted. Um, I would say that, you know, then when you look at foster care, it's a smaller number because in foster care specifically, we have had a whole push to try to remedy the removal of children of color outside of their race and cultural origins. And so we have kinship care, and we have in-home, you know, so we have all this movement to try to keep children with their biological families. Now for kids who are mixed race, sometimes that means a white family. So, you know, that get, but we don't collect statistics that allow us to really answer that question fully. But I would say we are, we hover at a rate that continues to be not much different than those 1970 numbers, anywhere from one in every three to up as high as 40% can be transracial, but the numbers are so unreliable that I just want to say, like, don't, don't believe them necessarily. Um, why do we keep on talking about transracial adoption in the way that we do is because we live in a nation that is socially constructed race as being truly two just race groups, white and black, and everything filters in between. And it is a very monocentric and binary way in which we've constructed race in our country. And so when we talk about race issues, we always default to black and white. This is what we are you know, socialized to do. It's the most sort of political, politicized way to evoke a racial imaginary about problems and politics and 
you know, the, the beauties of living um, cross racially. And so I just think that's our default language in, in kind of how we think about it. There are black people who are raising white children transracially. There are, you know, Mexican families who are raising uh, Asian children, you know, like, so it does exist in lots of different ways, but the demographics of our, our nation um, sort of, and the ways in which we've constructed race continue to sort of push this this way. Um, there are kids who are black and biracial who have been um, adopted to Canada because of the racial undesirability of some of the children. So it's just a very, to me, transracial adoption is one of those fields where if you want to understand the ways in which race and color still matter in our society, check out what's happening in the world of transracial adoption. Kids have different prices still attached to them based on skin tone. Adopters have very clear preferences for kids who are lighter skinned or from nations that are in various places on our racial hierarchy. There's class in terms of who can adopt at what price point, et cetera. And there are politics about who adopts where. So it just is one of the places where very quickly, I think it's hard to argue when you look at what statistics we do have. Um, the way skin tone still matters, the way gender matters, the way age matters, um, who is still languishing in foster care, and the financial means by which people who are adopting um, choose. And of course, there are exceptions to all of that, but it, the, the aggregate is pretty powerful. So, all right, I think we're at time. Are we, Tierra Chioma? We are, we wanted to poll people to see if they wanted to do an in-person one though. And I think Beth is trying to do it now, really okay. quick. <laughs> okay, well, while, while she's trying to do that, I'll just thank everybody for coming and listening. And if you do have any questions or anything afterwards, I'd be happy to get an email from you. So um, feel free to follow up. And it was good to see familiar faces here to those of you who I know, I'll just say hello to all of you, so. Thanks for coming out and supporting. Hi,